Okay, it looks like I am live. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Board Game Brunch, my monthly live May that I do right here on the Dice Tower the last Sunday of every month at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. GMT, trying to hit up people over across the pond to make sure that they get to see some of this live content as well, because I know a lot of the streaming stuff, at least that I do, tends to be in the evenings here in the States, and so therefore everybody across the pond is sleeping. Uh, I hope you all have had a really awesome September. Uh, we finally, it seems like the all the Gen Con stuff kind of wound down, and I know a lot of people are getting amped up for Essen. I am not going to Essen, kind of like thankfully and sadly. <laughs> like, obviously, I would love to go to Essen, but it's also nice to not have to prep for another big convention. So uh, hello to those of you who are in the chat. Um, this is a Q&A, so please feel free to drop any questions that you have for me in the chat at any time. Uh, and if you don't ask me questions, then I'm just going to ramble about whatever I want. So uh, you can ask me questions about games that I've been playing recently, uh, games that I haven't been playing recently, anything new from Gen Con that you want to hear my opinions on. Uh, I have played a lot of new games in the past couple of months, uh, as well as some old games that I had never played before. I actually, I wonder if you guys would be able to see this. If I pulled up my plays from the past few weeks, I could theoretically, let's see if I can show this on stream and if it'll focus. I don't even know if that'll work. Ooh, it's not focusing very well. Let's see if I could show you guys what I've been playing. Um, and scroll through, and then if you had questions about any of them, you can let me know. But some things that I have played and haven't talked about um, on Dice Tower Tonight or Board Game Blitz recently, or in the past couple of months, um, some games include uh, Tichu, which I had never played before. That's an older one, trick-taking game. Uh, another trick-taking game that I tried for the first time at Gen Con and haven't talked about was Skull King, which a lot of people really love, and now I know why. Uh, I tried Legendary Forests from Yellow, which I believe released at Gen Con, or if not at Gen Con soon before, but they had it at Gen Con. Um, I didn't buy it there, but a friend of mine picked it up, um, and we played that recently. I got to play Jaws from Ravensburger, the one based on the movie of the same title. Uh, let's see. Ooh, I tried the sequel. So I don't know if any of you know, I love escape room games, and my favorite of all time was Escape Room in a Box, The Werewolf Experiment. And the people who made that game came out with a sequel called Escape Room in a Box Flashback. And I got to play it somewhat recently as well. So if you want to hear my thoughts on that, no spoilers, obviously. Um, it'll be generic, but um, I'd be happy to share those. Uh, TV shows that I've been watching recently. Uh, I watched all of the new Amazon show uh, Undone. Uh, which I was very excited about. Um, my husband has actually been watching Deep Space Nine for the first time, so I am re-watching Deep Space Nine along with him, which is a delight, uh, always, of course. And I've been watching Veronica Mars for the first time. Uh, I'm now in season three. I just started season three of Veronica Mars, and I will say it doesn't look like season three is going to be as good, but who knows? Um, I still really like the show in general. Um, and then a whole bunch of my, like, favorite like network shows just came back this week. So uh, The Good Place, obviously my, I think it's, I, I say that Star Trek Discovery is my favorite, like The Good Place and Discovery are kind of right, like side by side for me as far as favorite shows go currently. Um, so The Good Place is back. So right now it's my favorite because Discovery isn't airing new episodes. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that everything over here is working properly. So we, we once, once YouTube got rid of Google Hangouts for streaming, it became more difficult for me to do these live streams because it isn't this, you don't launch things the same way as you used to. Um, let's see here. Oh, <laughs> my sister sent me a text. Let's see here. Oh, so Tom asked, how is my dog? Uh, so yes, uh, Lana um, is doing pretty good. She's still on three legs. Um, she tore her, in a human, it's called an ACL. In a dog, it's actually called a CCL, but she, she busted her knee and she has been walking on three legs now for a few weeks and she is scheduled for surgery on October 10th. So, 
Um, she's what's funny is she's getting along great right now. And after that surgery, she will not be, she has to basically be on bed rest slash crate rest for like eight weeks after the surgery and then uh, rehabbing it for another four to eight weeks after that. So basically the next three to four months are going to be pretty difficult for her and therefore for me and my husband as well. Um, which I'm not looking forward to, but I'm, I am looking forward to getting her leg fixed. Um, because while she can walk on three legs, she's, we're risking her damaging one of her other legs because she's not used to holding up her entire body on those three legs. So hopefully the surgery will go well. Um, we looked up information about the surgeon who is performing it and he has, he went to a really good school and has really good credentials because um, our vet's office doesn't have a surgeon. So they're bringing someone in to do the surgery and he looks great. So uh, we're hoping everything goes really well. Um, but yeah, we're going to have a dog that can't get around at all or can't go up and down the stairs in our house, which our living room and kitchen and everything are on the lower floor, but our bedroom is upstairs. And that is usually where the dogs sleep with us in that room. So I'm not certain how that's going to work because she's not going to be able to go up and down stairs at all for literal months. So we'll see. Uh, I'm sure everything will be fine. Um, let's see. Terry or Halo asked any new racing games that have shown up here recently. I don't know what here means. <laughs> Do you mean at my house in particular or in on the Dice Towers YouTube channel or in board games in general? I did see, I don't know if this is what you're asking or not, but I saw that there's a game on Kickstarter right now. Hold on. I'm going to look it up. It's a remake of an older game, I guess. And it's used to be about horse racing and now it's about unicorn racing and I won't lie that makes me interested <laughs> because I like rainbows and unicorns quite a bit uh let's see if I can find it with a quick search here unicorn fever and it's by horrible games and horrible games has a pretty good track record as far as I know um I yeah it's let's see I wonder if I can drop the link in the chat I should be able to hopefully that will work if anybody wants to look at what I'm looking at currently. Um, but this one, yes, it looks really neat. It looks very well produced based on the photos shown in the uh, Kickstarter campaign. Let's see, how much is it? How much is the game? Standard pledge is $33 to get the base game plus stretch goals. And then there's a deluxe version that has metal coins, plastic gems, other stuff. And then there's a fancy one. Oh, they paint the unicorns for you in the super fancy one. That's $99 though. Like I don't, I don't need a unicorn racing game that costs $99, but they look so cute painted. Oh my gosh. I shouldn't have looked at this. <laughs> I'm blaming you all. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, for the record, racing games are not one of my favorite genres. Typically, there are certain racing games that I really like, um, that kind of fall outside of the normal ones. I really like Gravwell, which most people don't think of as a racing game, but it is. Um, and Snow Tales, the one about, um, uh, I don't, sled dog racing. I couldn't think of the term. I did a rod with all that was entering my brain. And I know that that's a very specific race, but uh, I like snow tails quite a bit as well, but like, I don't like formula D formula day, whatever you want to call it. Um, and there's other racing games. Oh, I do like uh, downforce from restoration games. Downforce is a lot of fun. And actually I've been really wanting to try out the new expansion for downforce. So I'm hoping to get to try that in the near future. Um, okay. Uh, Battle Cry said, sad about Aaron Eisenberg passing away. Uh, that is an understatement. I was really sad. I wonder, do I have those pictures nearby? I might be able to show you all something cool without even getting up. If I have this in my desk, I think I do. Hold on. I know I'm leaning. Oh, I do have it. Yes. Okay. So, um, for those of you who are not Star Trek fans, Aaron Eisenberg is the actor who played Nog, who is one of the Ferengi on Star Trek. And uh, at 2018's Star Trek convention, um, he and Max Grodencheck um, got into full costume and makeup and did a photo op. And they've done this a few times. This was not unique to this convention, but I got a photo with them. Ooh, that's shiny. So this was this is Aaron Eisenberg as Nog uh, in 2018. 
Um, this was a fun photo op to do, I'm not going to lie. Um, and they were both so kind and so gracious. And Aaron was only 50 years old when he passed away. Um, uh, he was only born, he was born with one kidney and then had had that kidney replaced a number of years ago. So he had had some health issues, but this was not an expected thing. Um, and it's really sad that he passed away. So yeah, the Star Trek community has been kind of shaken by that happening, which it's really a bummer. Uh, I have other photos from that from I have other photo ops. If you want to see like, I have Kate Mulgrew, I'm actually wearing the shirt that I wore in my photo op with Kate Mulgrew. And she complimented it when uh, she saw it. Because uh, it's a quote from her character on Star Trek. Yeah, I've got some other ones, but whatever. I'm going to scroll down and keep going. Have I played Horrified? Uh, Jeremy's family is really enjoying it. What is your favorite Halloween themed games? I have not played Horrified yet, but I have heard nothing but good things. So I really want to try it out at some point. Um, my favorite Halloween themed games. This is actually a really good segue into something that I'm very excited about. So I think for me, I don't normally tend to play themed games around certain times of the year, but this year is an exception for me. Uh, one of the first games that I played when I got into the hobby back in 2007 was Betrayal at House on the Hill. And I don't play it often anymore, but I still have a lot of fond memories of it and I still own it and I still like it quite a bit, even though there are some flaws with the original game and the expansion. We don't have to talk about that. <laughs> but uh, I've been really curious about Betrayal Legacy because I like Betrayal and I've heard that Betrayal Legacy does some really cool things and a lot of people really like it. So my friend actually just messaged me this week and said, hey, um, a few of us, and it's the same group that I used to play Pandemic Legacy season one with, and we've played a bunch of other campaign games together, like Arcadia Quest, things like that. He said, uh, do you want to get together every Saturday in October and play through Betrayal Legacy? And I said, heck yes. Definitely, definitely, let's do that. So next Saturday, uh, we are going to start Betrayal Legacy. And I am so excited. I can't even tell you. So that is going to be my October gaming theme thing, I guess, is Betrayal Legacy in October. Uh, I'm really excited to try it out finally. Um, it has been a long time coming for me. I wanted to play this one for a while. So now that I have the opportunity, I'm really, really excited. Um, let's see here. Unicorn racing sounds dangerous. I mean, yeah, it could be. Who knows? Dan says, I missed the part from Dice Tower tonight where Tom would interact with chat to choose games and you and Eric would receive to review. Any way to pull something similar without Tom? Honestly, I would love to do something like that. The problem is that Tom is the one that gets oodles of review copies of games. I, uh, I know Eric gets some as well. I get barely any. Um, I just don't have a lot of publishers sending me stuff to review. Um, so it wouldn't really work because I think what Tom was doing is he was obviously like the big games, the really popular ones that he knows people want, he puts on their review pile for sure. And he's definitely reviewing those, but he gets in a lot of games that he doesn't know if he's going to cover them or not because they're smaller, they're lesser known, they're, you know, he has to allocate his time and he can't review everything. So I think he was taking those games and that's what he was bringing to Dice Tower tonight for that particular game. And it was helping him choose which of these little known games uh, are we going to review and foist off on Crystal and Eric. I really liked that part of the show too. Uh, and if there was an easy way to bring it back, then I would say... Yes, but I don't know how to do that because I don't have a pile of games sitting around uh, to review that I don't know anything about. All of the games that are at my house are ones that I have either purchased with my own money or like in rare cases, I do get some review copies. Um, they're ones that I've generally talked to a publisher with and specifically requested or they've reached out to me and I've agreed to take something. So like I actually just got some new games from Haba, which I'm really excited to try out. Um, but yeah, that wouldn't work for this type of game. So uh, if anybody has a solution, feel free to throw it in there. But I, I, I mean, I guess I could theoretically take older games of mine and like find ones that Eric hasn't played and send games to him to try. But then I don't know if there's much value in that if it's not newer. Cause I think that's what Tom was kind of looking for is most of the games he was putting onto that pile were newer games, just lesser known ones. And if I took games from my own collection, it would be older stuff. So if there's value in you all hearing Eric or my thoughts, maybe on games from each other's collections, 
that we haven't played, um, I guess that would be possible. So if you think that you would want to see that, um, then drop something in the chat and maybe Eric and I could talk and work that out. We just have to pay for shipping, which isn't a huge deal, um, especially if we don't maybe only do that like once a month. So not too bad. Uh, let's see here. Rude Dog Flick says, how much do you love Grouchy John's coffee? I don't think I've ever had Grouchy John's coffee. I know that there is one near me, um, but I am a Dunkin' Donuts girl. <laughs> uh, when I drink coffee, Dunkin' Donuts is my go-to. Although I like Starbucks too, uh, especially since they released their blonde roast because their original stuff too bitter for me, but the blonde is good. And this is just a latte from Dunkin' with skim milk and the caramel swirl. Cause I have to have a little bit of sweetness. Uh, I just, I need some sweetness in my life. <laughs> and I ordered this one yesterday. So this is me on day two. Cause I don't, I order the large cause it makes sense money wise, but then I don't drink the whole large at once. Cause that would be a lot of milk and coffee. Too much. <laughs> Uh, Jeff says, good morning, Crystal, the board game princess. I've never been called that before, but I would like to be going forward because that sounds lovely. <laughs> that is just great. Uh, Jeremy agreed that Snowtails and Downforce are both great. So yay. Uh, D David says, evening from the UK. Good evening, David. I'm so happy that I can do a stream where I get to talk to people from over on your side of the world because I know we don't usually get to see you all, at least not on my shows. Um just wandered into you talking about Voyager. Excellent. I'm currently re-watching it. Very cool. I'm trying to convince my husband that after he finishes Deep Space Nine that he should watch Voyager too. And I've pre prefaced that with, I think Deep Space Nine is better than Voyager, but I think Voyager is a lot better than people give it credit for. Uh, and I really like Voyager. There are more episodes in Voyager that are bad in general, but the overall story I think is great. So... Uh, Paul says, Betrayal brought me back to games as well. Yay, that's awesome. Yeah, 2007, uh, I was just out of college and working in Kansas City. Uh, I had a job at Ameristar Casino in Kansas City, actually working as a cashier in the poker room and then a blackjack dealer because 2007 was not a good time to graduate from college. <laughs> I could not find work anywhere. It was right before the recession when nobody was hiring because everybody was, all the jobs were filled, it seemed. And so I couldn't get work. So I started working at the casino and one of the poker dealers, uh, Ben, who I miss dearly, I don't, I haven't gotten to see him in literally years. He occasionally pops into these kinds of things. So I hope he does. That would be awesome. Ben, if you're here, hello. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he invited me to board game night at his house and a whole bunch of us worked the graveyard shift at the casino. Like our shifts were usually 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. or 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., which when I was in my early 20s was not that hard to do. If I tried to do that now, it's not happening. But um, so we would go over to Ben's house on our night off and we would start playing games around like 8, 9, 10 p.m., like that's when we would start and we would play until six o'clock in the morning. And then we'd go to Waffle House and get breakfast, of course. <laughs> oh, I'm Waffle House. I love it. Um, but yeah, like we would play lots of different games. Uh, he Betrayal at House on the Hill was a regular. Race for the Galaxy was a regular that hit the table a lot. Uh, Runebound was one that we played pretty frequently. And that was kind of my first big epic board game. And it made me fall in love with hobby games, truthfully. And I Runebound to this day is still one of my all-time favorite games. I love it so much. I think third edition is just as good, if not better, than second edition. Although I continue to say this, and I'm going to keep saying it, Fantasy Flight, please give me new maps. Please give me new boards for Runebound third edition. Please. I need new boards. I, I like all of the extra scenarios and characters, but I need a new board. Oh, I just hope sometime that they're going to do that. But yeah, uh, lots of other games that we played back in 2007. Uh, St. Petersburg, Ninja Burger. Uh, I think last night on Earth, he had that zombie game. What else? There were a whole bunch. Um, Puerto Rico. So yeah, that was that was my foray into the hobby. And then when I moved to Las Vegas in 2008, I didn't have a board game group. Um, I didn't have a board game collection of my own at that point. And then slowly over the past decade, I have accumulated my own collection and then got into the hobby and get, got into podcasting back in 2015, 16. What year did we start? 2016 is when I started the podcast. <laughs> it is hard to remember things. 
All right, let's see. The escape room game that I mentioned, well, both of them, how many players without someone being the odd one out and how long? Werewolf experiment, I think you said. Yes, so escape room in a box, the werewolf experiment originally started as a Kickstarter campaign and then got picked up by Mattel um, and got brought to mass market by Mattel. And I know that sounds like a bad thing. It is not. Um, I know that the Kickstarter edition did have different stuff or more stuff in it. I have never played the Kickstarter edition of the game. I've only played the mass market version. So all of my thoughts are about what in theory is the lesser version of the game. And it is my favorite escape room game like easily. And I love the exit games. I've really liked some of the unlock games. Escape Room in a Box is a lot of fun too, but Escape Room the game. No, no, this is Escape Room in a Box. What's the other one? Escape Room the game. Is that the one where it has the like little plastic thing with the keys? Whatever that one is. Oh, they're all named so similarly. Escape Room in a Box, the werewolf experiment is what I'm talking about here. And that one is my favorite. Um, it... It is hard. It, it says that it's an hour on the box, um, but that time can vary based on some things that happen within the game. Um, and it says that you can play with up to eight people. I would say eight is definitely too many. Like 100% you do not want to play with eight people. Um, there aren't enough things to go around for that many. And I think that's true of most escape room board games. I think the highest end of the player counts are usually a bad idea. I played both the werewolf experiment and the sequel flashback with two people. And we were worried that two people wouldn't be enough. And I will say that we had an amazing time playing it with two people. So I would say based on our experience, you could go up to four people easily and be just fine. No issues at all. I would say more than four and you're going to end up with that situation where a couple people are working on a thing and somebody else is sitting over here and they, now they've solved it. And the other person is like, well, what happened? I didn't even get to participate in that part. Um, but honestly, I thought it wouldn't work with two and it worked really well with two. We were able to solve both boxes within the time given without any major issues at all. Um, so these are definitely, I would say on the easier side of some of the escape room games, but they are more clever than a lot of the escape room games. And honestly, like my favorite part of escape room games are those moments, those aha moments that you have where you're just like, I can't figure this out. <gasps> That's it. Oh my gosh, it was, it should have been obvious. And it's right here. And we had a lot of those moments of just like pure delight of the types of puzzles that they threw in here and the physical components that they use are great as well. And while you do manipulate the pieces in a way that makes them somewhat unusable again they if you go to their website you can actually print off new components to put back in the box to make it reusable so i really love both escape room in a box the werewolf experiment and flashback and the difference they're similar uh, in the types of puzzles that they utilize the flashback game is unique and this again i'm not spoiling anything here um but when you open up the box you see that there are three different paths to take and they're color coded. So there's the red path, I think the blue path and the purple path. Each one has its own set of puzzles that are lead to one another to a final thing. And so what it says is theoretically you can break it up into multiple play sessions. You can play the blue one night and the purple another night and the red another night or whatever. Uh, we played all of it together all at once and it did not take that long. Um, it's not like these paths are full hour long games by themselves. Um, but it, it is neat because in theory, if you do have a larger group, you could give the blue components to one group and the red components to another and the purple components to another. Now, if you are those people that are like, well, but yeah, but I didn't get to see how any of the blue stuff worked, then that's a bummer. And that's why we kind of, me and my friend Kathy just played it with the two of us because we wanted to experience the whole thing. Um, but I really, really loved it. And you can get these at Target, both the Werewolf Experiment and Flashback. Since it's by Mattel, you can just pick up at your local Target. I would imagine they are also for sale on Cool Stuff Inc. Um, and any of the other online retailers. And since Cool Stuff Inc. does sponsor the Dice Tower, I want to mention them. Um, but yeah, if you just run out to your local Target, you can just grab it. And I highly, highly recommend these. I think that a lot of gamers have not tried these ones. And I they're my faves. Easily. Hands down, my favorites. So uh, yeah, they're great. 
let's see here, T -t -t Battle Cry talked about Nog's character progression on DS9. Yeah, he is, of all of Star Trek, he's got one of the best character arcs easily. And it's so funny because when the show starts, you're like, well, that seems like a dumb one-off character that's not important. And then you realize uh, later, like, no, no, his he's important and some really interesting stuff happens to him. Um, let's see here. T -t 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 Jeremy says, I noticed that Tom unboxed his copy of Architects and Paladins of the West Kingdom. I ordered mine on Kickstarter and haven't received it yet. Agony, does this happen to you? Uh, yes, that does happen to me sometimes. I think the whole, like, there's Kickstarter and there's pre-orders and there's regular orders and whatever else. Um, did So did Tom get his through Kickstarter or did he just get review copies? Because that might have been what happened is Tom might have just had copies sent to him by the publisher. Uh, I can't, I don't know that for sure. I'm not certain, but um, yeah, sometimes um, I have seen games that I ordered end up in other places first. And there have been instances where Kickstarters um, ended up being sold at conventions before they shipped to Kickstarter backers because of issues, you know, that the publisher was having and whatever else. And honestly, I've kind of gotten to a place where it doesn't bother me because yes, if I'm excited about a game, I want to get it as soon as possible so I can play it and try it and hopefully enjoy it. But other people enjoying a thing doesn't necessarily lessen my experience. So I kind of just like, oh man, they've got it and I don't. And then I just move on. And that's, it just, I, there's so many other things in the world to worry about that that's one that I try not to stress about. Okay, going back to the Dice Tower Tonight game thing. Dan says, maybe Tom could send you to a list of games for each show and y'all could just use images and descriptions to narrow down what Tom would send you. That's actually not a bad idea. I could I could reach out to Tom and see if he would want to do that. Um, honestly, though, I think the reason Tom liked that game so much was not that he was making us review possibly crummy games, but he liked torturing us like with his like trivia and random stuff and making us battle it out between the two of us. So, but that is definitely an idea that we could approach for sure. Uh, Terrier Halo says, hello from a dark Northern Sweden. Uh, that is awesome. Somebody from Sweden. Very cool. Um, I love it. Ooh, and I'm going to forget to say this later, potentially. So everyone who is here right now, if you could do me a favor and in the YouTube window right below the video, if you could click the little thumbs up button, that would make me super happy and I would really appreciate it because it helps with the YouTube algorithms and uh, makes, you know, it just makes me joyful <laughs> when I see a lot of thumbs up on a video. Also, some of my videos just get random thumbs downs for like no reason, usually before they've happened. So like we'll put up the stream like, you know, in advance and somebody will click the thumbs down button. And I'm like, you can't dislike a thing that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Maybe they just don't like me. They're like, more crystal content. We don't want to see any of that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Joe says, hello and good afternoon. Just wondering, what are your favorite horror-themed games to play? I don't think I have a lot of horror-themed games. Um, I do like Dead of Winter. And I own, I own both Dead of Winter, The Long Night, and I actually own Dead of Winter Flick 'em Up, um, which I think is super underrated and I don't, it did not hit well when it came out, um, but Dead of Winter, Flick em Up or Flick em Up Dead of Winter, I don't remember what order the words are in, is really cool. Uh, so if you can find that one uh, at a reasonable price, I recommend it because it's really neat. I'm um, looking at other games that are in my room right now to see what else is horror themed. Um, I mean, Betrayal of House on the Hill, like I talked about earlier, definitely fits within that category. Um, I, once I try Horrified, that will obviously fit there, but I haven't tried it yet. I don't know, like, would Jaws be considered a horror game? Because I really liked Jaws, but I don't, is that horror? It's weird. It's one versus many, but the theme is kind of horror-esque. I don't know. Man-eating shark is definitely, it feels like that's horror. The movie was horror, so I, the game has to be, right? Um, I'm trying to think of what other horror-themed games I own. I don't think I own a lot of horror themed games. And actually I wish there were more. It's just tough, I think, because to capture that sense of dread is difficult to do in a game. Um, and there have been a couple of games that I think have captured it better than others. But I think usually without the ambiance of um, 
music and visuals like in a movie it's hard to capture that scary vibe or that like jump scare vibe um, and there have been games that have been able to do things like that um, but it's hard to say what without spoiling certain stuff so um, we had a boosted comment from Otter. Hi, Otter. He says, my favorite horror game tip is Mythos Tales. So I have actually played Mythos Tales. I've played through the entire campaign of Mythos Tales. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what Mythos Tales is, uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is a game that came out originally in the 70s. And some fans of Sherlock Holmes started creating fan scenarios to it that were set in the Cthulhu world, in like the Lovecraftian world. Then they turned that into its own game, uh, created a full campaign and put it on Kickstarter. And then um, it went out through Kickstarter and then eventually Gray Fox Games picked it up and published it proper as well. So uh, Gray Fox Games sponsors my podcast, Board Game Blitz. I like to say that anytime I mention them, but they. what's funny is that won't really matter in a second because I hated Mythos Tales, but I have not played the version of the game that Gray Fox published. So the Kickstarter edition of the game was riddled with errors. And I mean bad, like the game breaking mistakes all over the place. The map was messed up. The information in the book was messed up. Character names were messed up. So many things were messed up. And my friend Kathy, that I mentioned earlier, oh, bless her, went through and used errata that had already been posted online to try and fix a bunch of the mistakes, like literally made changes to her board and put sticky notes on things and addressed a lot of it. And so I can't say for sure whether the errors are what made me dislike it so much, but I, maybe the, this game system is just not for me. I've never played Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, but I was so frustrated with mythos tales, even with, with the errors or without, there were certain things that like, when you got to the end and saw what the solution was, I like to have that feeling of, oh man, we were right there and we almost had it and we, darn it, we just didn't figure it out. In Mythos Tales, that's not what happened. In Mythos Tales, it was always, wait, that's the solution? How? Where? Why? We never would have gotten that. And we would look back and try and figure it out. And just literally, we were nowhere near the correct answers in a lot of instances. And there were, even with the errata at the time that we played it, which is years ago now, um, there were still other mistakes that the errata hadn't even addressed yet. So I just, yeah. Okay. So Otter says the second printing of the game was better. Um, I do believe that. And Gray Fox Games, I do love them and they are a wonderful company. So I have no doubt that they fixed a lot of the issues with the game. But when I played it, they had not published it yet. So I... I just, I did not like it. I bounced off Mythos Tales real hard. Uh, I know a lot of people love that game, but I guess now you know that like, just because somebody sponsors me does not mean I'm going to talk positively about their stuff. I am sure Gray Fox did a better job with it, but I still don't like Mythos Tales and I will never play it again. So I think other people who really like Lovecraft or Cthulhu um, will probably enjoy it. Oh, Alex wants me to move the microphone closer because there's an echo. Yeah, this room, I don't have all of my soundproofing up at the moment. Let me see. I'm, I, if it gets super loud here, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom of the chat because otherwise this could get iffy fast. But there's probably going to be an echo regardless because of the room I'm in. I'm going to move. Oh, gosh. Everything is all twisted up over here. Sorry you're hearing some noises. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry. Please don't leave. <laughs> I swear I'm just going to move some things. We're going to put my headphones over here. Put this. Actually, I should use this if I'm going to. I will put up my pop filter and we will attempt to make the audio better for you all. Um, to twist this onto my desk because I don't have a way to twist it on my current microphone. And I'm going to move the microphone closer to me and I will be able to turn the volume on it down. But please um, let me know if the volume goes completely crazy loud. Okay. So you let me know quickly. It's, I'm going to be picking it up warning to people wearing headphones in case the noise from me picking it up is bad. So prepare yourselves. Okay, ready? All right, here we go. Uh, we're gonna move it. And we're gonna put it over here. Sometimes when I put it too close to myself, everybody complains that I'm really loud. I mean, I'm just a loud person. 
So I uh, will just do like this and um, just here, we'll move this right here. You guys will just have to look at the pop filter. Um, I apologize if the audio quality has been bad for the whole episode, um, but please let me know how that sounds, if that is better. I'm not seeing any new messages in the chat. So have you all left? I don't know what's happening. Uh, sounds great. Okay, well, I apologize because if I get loud again, it might get intense because the microphone is closer to me now. Better, okay, cool. Um, so perfect. I'm gonna scroll back up because I know I missed a bunch of stuff when I saw those messages and scroll down. Do, 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 do. Let's see here. Comments about Voyager. Yes, Voyager is awesome. Uh, Jeremy says, I really want to play through Clank Legacy, so I'm actively trying to recruit a group so we can play it when it comes out. Uh, I am also very interested in Clank Legacy. I really like Clank quite a bit, and I want to play Clank Legacy also. Also, I have a sneeze stuck in my nose right now. I don't think it's going to come out, but I might be making some funny faces until it goes away. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, Alex says, what are your favorite small box games? Um, well, the Tiny Epic series, um, I really love Tiny Epic Quest of that series uh, quite a bit. I love um, a lot of the button shy wallet games. Um, my favorites are uh, Sprawlopolis, Circle the Wagons, and Tussie Mussie, which is literally shipping to Kickstarter backers right now, but I've played the print and play version of Tussie Mussie before. Those three are my favorites. Um, and then I really like a few of the Pac-O-Game games from uh, Perplexed and Chris Handy. They're the little games that come in boxes that are the size of a like stick of gum box, like tiny. Um, the some really good ones in that series, Hue, H-U-E, Shh. S H H. <laughs> that game is hard to say in name. Uh, Dig is really fun. Um, oh, what's the so S O W is good. Um, and I haven't played all of those, but I do own all of them. I just haven't played all of them because yeah. Let's see here. Oh yeah, somebody said Jaws is horror. Yeah, that seems right. Like I did guess when we were playing it, it didn't feel horror esque, and I was playing as the shark. I did not win. <laughs> they 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 uh they did too well. So what's neat about Jaws is it's broken into two acts, and based on how the team of people and the shark do in Act One determines how strong they are in Act Two. And they caught me pretty quickly in Act One, so I I don't know how I could have even won, but uh, it was still a really fun game. I had a moment of pure frustration because they caught me at a time that I didn't think they should, but um, it was still fun. So. Uh, Bones and Banners is from Gustavsburg, Sweden. Uh, good time for a live stream. Awesome. Uh, I probably pronounced the city wrong and I apologize. <laughs> Last Friday also has a classic horror theme. That's true. I've heard of Last Friday. That's kind of like the slasher, like murderer going after a group of teens feel. I've never played it. I've heard mixed things about that one. I know some people really like it and some people aren't as big of a fan, but... Uh, Richard Saunders is a fan of Mythos Tales, says it's pretty awesome, um, and says that the Eighth Summit publisher is no longer around. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, Joe Leal, I actually have Atmosphere. Since oh my gosh, how did I forget Atmosphere? Hold on, I actually is it like nearby? Can I grab it? I feel like it's in here, but maybe it's not. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep trying to look around my computer monitors. Atmosphere is awesome. <laughs> I love it. Um, also called Nightmare for those of you who are in the States, but I have a copy of Atmosphere, the one that came out in the UK. Um, Dan Hughes of Sporadically Bored, and uh, you all have seen him on Board Game Breakfast with Cora. Uh, he actually got a copy of Atmosphere for me a couple of years ago. Uh, so delightful. <laughs> I love that game so much. And actually, Matthew Jude recently picked up um, one of the sequels to that game for me that is impossible to find in the States, but in the UK, it shows up in thrift stores all the time. Um, so Atmosphere had, like, it had um, the base game, and then there were three expansions to it, which gave you new cards and components, but you use the, the first game's board. Uh, and they came with new VHS tapes as well. But then after those four were released, a new game was released in the same line. Um, it's called, 
atmosphere, like Khufu's, hold on. I'm gonna have to look it up. Atmosphere, I gotta spell it right. Atmosphere, F-E-A-R, Khufu the mummy. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Atm atmosphere, Khufu the mummy, the board game or DVD board game. So yeah, it comes with a DVD, the board, and a lot of bunch of cool components. And Matthew Jude knew that I wanted a copy of it. And he found one in a thrift store and got it for me. And he has it over in the UK. And I am so excited to get it from him at some point. Because <laughs> I've never played that one. And I really, really want to. So yeah, as far as horror games go, that that is the best. <laughs> I mean, and by best, I mean not actually the best, but most enjoyable. I don't know. Atmosphere is a great time. You have to, especially if you have people that get into it, it's really good. Uh, David M asks, does Dice Tower have any plans for a gaming marathon? I don't know <laughs> is the answer to that question. I would imagine yes, maybe, possibly. Um, but since I am not located in Florida with the rest of the gang, I don't always get to hear all of the discussions that go on about upcoming events. Um, so they just had the retreat at the beginning of September. They are going to be going to Essen here in the near future. Um, and then I'm going to PAX Unplugged. I don't know if the rest of the Dice Tower is coming to PAX Unplugged. Um, I'm just going on my own. Uh, so if any of you are going to be at PAX Unplugged in December, I will be there. Um, and then we've got uh, the Dice Tower Cruise in January, and then we have Dice Tower West at the end of February, beginning of March, um, and that's here in Las Vegas where I live. So there are a lot of things coming up in the near future for the Dice Tower, so I would imagine if they're going to do a gaming marathon, uh, maybe December? I don't know. I'm just guessing. I have no actual information. So who knows is the answer. Um, next time Tom does the Q&A, which would probably be tomorrow, um, you should ask him because he would know better than I do. Uh, Jeremy says, Dead of Winter is one of those games where we just enjoy the base game. Long Night was okay, but we feel we don't need to play with that extra content. I actually agree with you. I got the Long Night really cheap. Um, it went on sale somewhere. I don't remember. I don't remember where exactly, but I got it for like $20. It was something, it was really cheap compared to the normal MSRP. And so I was like, well, I might as well pick it up, but I, I don't I don't need to own it, truthfully. Uh, David M, who is your favorite Dice Tower person to play a game with? Who is the most competitive? Ooh, those are good questions. <sighs> favorite to play with? I don't think I could choose. I love playing games with Suzanne. I love playing games with Z. I love playing games with Eric. Uh, I haven't played a lot of games with Sam. Tom and I have played a few games together here and there. I think Tom is pretty competitive. It's weird because he acts like he doesn't care, but I think he does. Um, I, Sam might be kind of competitive as well. Z is pretty chill. Eric's pretty chill. Suzanne is generally pretty chill. Uh, oh, no, Jason. Jason is the most competitive. I should <laughs> scrap everything I just said about competitive people. It's Jason. I have Don't play games with Jason unless you want to get your butt kicked. <laughs> basically. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, okay, let's see here. Have I had the opportunity to play games at conventions with other Dice Tower members? If so, what was your favorite experience? Uh, yeah, I've played games with all of the other Dice Tower people uh, multiple times over the past few years. Um, my favorite experience. So the first year that Tom, Sam, and Z came to MeepleCon, uh, and MeepleCon is the convention here in Las Vegas that is now Dice Tower West. Um, but it used to be called MeepleCon. So the first year that they came to that event, a person that used to be in my game group named Tony brought out the game Pecunia Non Olet, um, which I'll let you all Google that. I think based on my pronunciation, you should be able to spell it reasonably. Um, it is a game about running toilets in ancient Rome. <laughs> And you literally have Roman citizens lining up to use your bathrooms. And there are long wooden pieces that get placed onto the toilets in your area. And I will let you all figure out what that. So <laughs> Tony brought this game out and made, made Tom, Sam, and Z play it. And the poop jokes that ensued were just... <laughs> It was nonsense. Uh, the game is not that good, for the record. Like, it really is not. But the 
fun that we had playing it was very memorable. And it was one of the first times, I think, so I had already played a game with Z during that MeepleCon, but I don't know if I had played anything with Tom or Sam yet. This was a few years ago. And so I think that was the first game I ever played with all three of them together. Uh, and I totally won, by the way. I guess I'm the best at running toilets in ancient Rome. That's not really an accomplishment, but whatever. Um, it was a lot of fun. Lots of lots of euphemisms and toilet humor. And yeah, it was it was a good time. You know, if you are, enjoy juvenile humor every now and then. So, <laughs> um, oh, and Otter, I meant, saw this earlier, but I didn't mention it. Uh, Otter said, so excited to meet the Dice Tower crew in Essen again. I am sure that they are very excited to see you too. Uh, I so wish I could be there. I wish I could go to Essen. It's just so far away, like literally so far away. All right, let's see here. Um, Sprawlopolis is so good, says Alex. I uh, love that it can just fit in your pocket. Sprawlopolis is way better than it should be based on the fact that it's only 18 cards. <coughs> Excuse me. It is cooperative. It is, it works well but for one to four players. An 18 card cooperative game and it is brilliant. It's so good. I really love Sprawlopolis. Go to Button Shy's website and buy that game, y'all. It is amazing. You will be blown away by how much game there is in those 18 cards. Honestly, it is great. Um, let's see here. Uh, Vanessa says, happy brunch. Uh, Vanessa says, I'll be there. I'd love to play a game with you, Crystal. I imagine you were talking about Pax Unplugged from earlier, and that sounds awesome. Definitely come find me and we'll play a game together. Uh, and then Richard said, can you only get Sprawlopolis from their website? Is it in distribution? I think you can only get it directly from Button Shy. Um, but one of the cool things that Button Shy does is when they run a Kickstarter campaign for a new game, usually you can add on their other titles as part of your pledge. So if you keep an eye on Button Shy's Kickstarter campaigns, um, you should be able to back a new game and get some of the older titles too. And Sprawlopolis, Circle the Wagons, and Tussie Mussie are the three that I would most highly recommend. Um, there are others that I've played that are also good, but those are my three favorites. PAX Unplugged is close to BGG Con, and BGG Con is the best. I went to BGG Con last year and had a really good time, um, but I just had to make some decisions this year, and the timing for BGG Con didn't work out for me. Um, and also I would have had to take more time off work. And since the Dice Tower Cruise is in January and Gen Con was in August, days off between those two things for me are tough. I don't have as many. And I was able, I'm able to do PAX Unplugged with less total days off from work. So, and I've never been to PAX Unplugged and I don't usually go to a lot of cons on the East Coast. So I'm really excited to check out PAX Unplugged. But yeah, BGG Con was great also. I really loved it. There's not a particular reason that I'm not going back this year other than just it doesn't work out this year. So, oh, Jeff Rainwater put the description of uh, Pecunia non Olet in the chat, which I can read for you all if you didn't see his comment. It says, a card game in, the old, in old Rome in which the players act as rental toilet owners who have to earn their money from the Romans who feel an urgent need. <laughs> that That's very true. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, let's see here. David asks, um, David says, this might be really random, but I just came back from making a sandwich. Do you like mustard? If so, what's your favorite, favorite sandwich type? Uh, I do not like mustard <laughs> at all. Any kind. I'm not a mustard fan. No regular mustard, no, uh, brown mustard, no honey mustard, no mustards. Uh, in fact, yesterday at my friend's, uh, party, um, that they were having, uh, they had a bunch of different cheeses and one of the cheeses looked like it had mustard seeds in it. And so I was less interested, even though I love cheese. Um, so no favorite type of mustard. Um, my favorite sandwich type. I mean, I'm not big on sandwiches, which is weird, but it's been a thing for me my whole life that like sandwiches, I, cause I don't like combinations of foods. I'm a picky eater. I've gotten better as an adult, but there's still certain things that I'm not good with. And lots of different foods in combination is often something that I am not great with. Um, but yeah, uh, a grilled cheese sandwich. How about we go there? I love, especially a really, like I'm not talking a plain like white bread and American cheese. Like that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about like 
a nice sourdough with maybe like a Gouda and a softer cheese, like a brie or a goat cheese or some like, oh my gosh, now I want a grilled cheese sandwich. Oh, grilled cheese done right is just cannot be beat um, with maybe like a really nice thick tomato soup on the side. And I'm not usually a soup person, but if you give me a grilled cheese and some tomato soup to dip it in, that's basically, it's like, it's like marinara sauce, but it's tomato soup and you, it's the same thing. I mean, it's not, but it is, it is, eh, whatever. Somebody can argue with me in the chat. It's delicious. If you gave me a bowl of marinara, it would work the same way for me. So, um, Jeremy says, I picked up Flying Sushi Kitchen from your recommendation. My kids laughed a lot and enjoyed it, but we really didn't care to follow the rules. We just played to play. I think that that's fine. And it, with a silly dexterity game like that, yeah, the cards, the the rules themselves, there's not much of like merit there, um, but it is really fun to grab the little foam balls with the chopsticks. I Flying Sushi Kitchen is delightful and it just so silly. Um, but I'm glad that you and your kids are enjoying it because, yeah, it was great. And it was fun to show off on that episode of Dice Tower Tonight a while back. Uh, Corey said, good morning. Interestingly, pecunia non olet means money doesn't smell. And it's a famous reply when a Roman senator was made fun of for running a latrine. I did not know that. I remembered that it like meant something clever, but I couldn't remember what that was. Um, so yeah, that's your, you're running. And literally in the course of the game, there's certain Romans that like, like the fancy Romans won't be, be seated next to commoners or they'll score you less. It's weird. Um, but I mean, it's one of those games. Like if I saw it in a thrift store, I would, and somebody was like, should I got, get this? I'm like, if it's really cheap, it's worth a few laughs, but it's not a great game. So Joe also doesn't like mustard. I'm right there with you, Joe. Um, let's see here. Richard asks, or says, I wonder if there's a correlation with liking mustard and mythos tales. I like both and Crystal likes neither. <laughs> Maybe. We should do a survey. Do you like mythos tales? Do you like mustard? <laughs> uh, uh, somebody says, do you know Austria? I've actually been to Austria. Uh, it has been a very long time. Let's see. I was in Austria in 2005. So gosh, that was 14 years ago. Uh, I was I was 20 years old. <laughs> it was the spring of 2005 when I was in Austria. I got to, I didn't get to stay for very long. Um, I was on a tour with my college's choir. We were performing around that section of Europe. We performed in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, and in Austria. Um, we performed in Vienna, and I loved Vienna. I To this day, when people ask me, like, where, where would you live if you could live anywhere? My, usually my number one answer is a beach somewhere, because I love ocean air. But number two behind a beach would be Vienna because it was so green and lush and beautiful and incredibly dog friendly. Everybody had their dogs out everywhere, just like with them and like walking into stores and going everywhere. So I really fell in love with Vienna quite a bit. Um, and I got to, um, I went up on the Praha Ferris wheel there in Vienna. Um, and the, <laughs> There's a funny story um, that uh, I will tell you all if you want about bungee jumping in Vienna. If that is something that interests you, put it in the chat. Let me know. Um, I won't. It's a. It's not a super long story, but it is. It is one of my favorite stories to tell from my whole life. Um, so if you guys want to hear about my bungee jumping in Vienna, Austria story uh, when I was 20 years old, let me know. Um, David says, mm, "Like a cheese melt can be truly amazing." Yeah, yeah, grilled cheese, so good. Kathleen says, I'm having grilled cheese and tomato for dinner tonight. Ooh, fancy. Uh, Otter says, French mustard is so good. Uh, you know, I just, I guess I don't know the um, the, the magic of the mustard. Um, <laughs> I just, mustard is just, I, condiments in general, I tend to be kind of picky with. Like, I don't really like mayonnaise either. Um, ketchup is fine, but it's nothing special. Um, a really good barbecue sauce or a really good buffalo sauce. I can get behind either one of those. Um, oh, bye, bye, Richard. We'll see you at Dice Tower West. Thanks for joining. Um, okay, we had a couple people say that they want to hear the bungee jumping story. And since it seems like I've mostly run out of questions, I can tell you all the story. Uh, I will warn you that there is a curse word that is involved in this story later on, but I will bleep it out when it happens, like self 
like I'm not going to actually put a beep in, obviously, but just the, the curse word is an integral part of the story. So I will just warn you all of that in advance. In case you have little ones watching, I will edit it to some degree, but I just want you to be aware that it is going to come up in this story. So uh, me and my friend David uh, were on the Praha Ferris wheel, which used to be the tallest in the world. Um, there are quite a few now that have surpassed it. The London Eye, the High Roller here in Las Vegas. I believe there's one in Dubai also. So it used to be the tallest, isn't anymore. We were on it and we looked out over the like amusement park area that it was kind of part of. And David pointed something out to me and he was like, oh, hey, that looks like the ripcord, that ride at Worlds of Fun in Kansas City. I grew up in Kansas City. He knew this, obviously. And I said, oh, yeah, that does kind of look like the ripcord. And then he was like, oh, no, wait, it's bungee jumping. And you don't see bungee jumping at amusement parks in the States, like anywhere that I've ever seen. <laughs> it's not a common thing. And he was like, we should totally do it. I'm not really afraid of heights, but bungee jumping in the middle of a foreign country uh, without, you know, my parents being aware when I was 20 years old seemed like kind of an iffy idea. But I'm thinking, well, if it is like the ripcord that ride in Kansas City, there's pr you probably have to sign up in advance and there's a long line and it's really expensive. And, you know, chances are we won't actually do it. So I told David, yeah, let, let's do it. Let's go over there. So we go over. Um, there are two gentlemen running the bungee jumping stand um, and neither one of them speak any English at all, really. Like we are able to communicate at only a very basic level with them. I knew a little bit of German, but it didn't help in this situation because I didn't study bungee jumping related terms. Um, but we were able to find out that the price was pretty reasonable. I think it was something like 40 euros for the two of us together to go jump tandem. So it wasn't a ton of money um, and there was no wait. <laughs> we were gonna get on right away. So all of my excuses flew out the window and I had to bungee jump. And I was like, okay, let's do this. So they put David and I onto a scale and weigh us so they can determine what the cord length needs to be. And this process is going by very quickly. And I'm like, that doesn't seem safe, but whatever, they're experts, it's fine. Um, and then they put us onto a platform and then that platform starts going up into the air over the top of this giant airbag. And that's all that's below us, not water, not like... Any, it's just like a, one of those um, things that you see uh, in like uh, summer camp movies that's in the water, like the blob kind of whatever. It's like a big airbag, but it's on the ground. So the platform is raising up over this and we're it's slow. So we're just going up and up and up and up and up. And the gentleman who is on the platform with David and I tries to make small talk with us. But since he doesn't really speak English, it doesn't go well. So he's asking us where we're from. Um, kind of, and we're trying to explain our college was in Iowa. So we were like, uh, Iowa, United States, middle, corn, farming, you know, like we're trying to give him some words and he's nodding, but you can tell he doesn't have a clue what we're saying, which is fine, whatever, <laughs> everything's fine. Platform gets to the top and warning, this is the part of the story I warned you all about in advance. Again, I will self edit, but just be aware. Uh, David looks out uh, like over the edge of the platform and he kind of like leans over and he looks. And the gentleman who has not spoken coherent sentences of English to us the entire time turns to David and looks him dead in the eyes. I'm gonna move this. And he says, don't look down. It's effing high. <laughs> and he did not say the edited version of that word. He said the actual version of that word. And David and I were just like, wait, this is the, the sentence he knows in English? This is the sentence he knows? <laughs> like of all of the sentences to be able to speak in English, that's the one he knows. So he takes my arms and wraps them around David and takes David's arms and wraps them around me. And I'm thinking, okay, moment to compose ourselves. After that, you know, holy moly, we gotta, I gotta think about this a little bit. And he goes, three, two, one, and shoves us off the platform. <laughs> And <laughs> just like no time for us to reconsider or ask for a refund or anything. <laughs> he just shoves us off the platform and we are bungee jumping. And uh, it was honestly like one of the best experiences ever. Uh, truthfully, bungee jumping can be quite painful. And it was a little bit for us because as you're bouncing, like all of the blood in your body is following what gravity should do. And it's kind of rushing into your head and that's not very comfortable. Um, but yeah, uh, that was, 
an amusing uh, experience. And uh, we used to have video of us actually jumping. Um, and it was on David's MySpace page <laughs> way long ago. And I think it's been lost to time. I don't have a copy of it anymore. Uh, but I was basically just screaming the whole time. So just picture this, me, normally, but just like at a higher volume and a higher pitch for like a two minutes straight. That's basically all it was. So uh, that is my bungee jumping in Vienna, Austria story. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed it. It's one of my favorites to tell and I've never told it here on YouTube before. So um, let's see here. I don't think we have any other questions in the chat and we are basically at our end time. So uh, again, if you guys haven't clicked the thumbs up button below the video, please do that for me. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all so much for joining me for my monthly q and I am here every Sunday, not every Sunday. Oh gosh, that'd be too much. I am here the last Sunday of every month uh, at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. GMT. Uh, and I love speaking with you all and answering your questions. Um, we have another episode of Dice Tower tonight coming up. Is that this week? Yes, this Wednesday. Um, and that is at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, so less friendly for our European friends and further. Um, but hopefully some of you all will be able to join Eric and I for Dice Tower tonight. And thank you all again for joining me. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking with you all. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday, a wonderful rest of your weekend, a great week, and a wonderful October. It's We're heading into spoopy time, spooky time. Uh, and yeah, I will see you all later. Thanks for joining me for Board Game Brunch. Bye!